So thank you. So it's my great pleasure to introduce my colleague, Mr. Gianluca Lucchesi, uh, to give this talk on um, the surgical aspects of this. Um, now, managing this group of patients is a real challenge because essentially the aneurysm itself or the dilatation is asymptomatic. And what we're trying to do is um, define when the right threshold and uh, time for intervention is and what the right prophylactic intervention is. And that's not a decision that we can make individually with the patient. It's part of a multidisciplinary team and having good surgical input to help make those right decisions is really key and a good working relationship with some sensible surgeons is really important. Um, so um, and Gianluca and his team are great at, um, at supporting me in, in, in this and it's great to, it's great pleasure to introduce him to talk about this aspect. So let me hand over to him. Thank you very much, Yasu. Uh, thank you for the invitation, first of all, and also the kind introduction. Um, I'm trying to share my screen if I can. Can you see it? Uh, yes, we can. Yes. OK, so I've been given the task of presenting on surgical management of orthopathy. Actually, Christoph has uh, introduced the most of the surgical strategies uh, and has already basically anticipated the part of my talk, but I try to be brief in order not to make the presentation too long, although it's, it's a pretty broad topic. Uh, I will try to go straight to the point. Um, this is a, the beautiful place where I've got the privilege to work. And uh, before discussing the specific aspects of the inherited orthopathies, uh, I wanted to introduce a couple of uh, brief concepts. We all know the anatomical classification of the aorta, but what we might not know is that the different segments of the aorta uh, do originate by different uh, uh, embryogenic layers. Therefore, they are not uh, uh, affected necessarily simultaneously, and uh, different orthopathies have got preferences for different segments of the heart. I think that this, uh, this is a very important message to keep in mind. Uh, in general, orthopathies uh, are uh, a multifactorial uh, phenomenon, so as most of the cardiovascular disease, uh, but the inherited orthopathies have got the genetic component that is predominant, although the expressivity might be variable. Uh, as I mentioned, there might be different type of uh, orthopathies, but the, the, the subject of this presentation will be the inherited orthopathies. Uh, Characteristically, uh, they do affect generally younger patients uh, with family history. Often we've got syndromic patients with characteristic features. Differently, the acquired orthopathies are uh, sporadic, generally affecting the older population uh, and patients with risk factors. So inherited orthopathies are mainly the bicuspid aortic valve, Mar Marfan syndrome, Lois Dietz, Enler Danlos, Turner syndrome, and familiar orthopathies. And this is what we are going to discuss today in my presentation. The bicuspid orthopathy, it, it's uh, uh, relatively frequent. Uh, the prevalence of bicuspid aortic valve is around 1%, and the orthopathy does affect uh, uh, between 30 and 80 percent of patients with bicuspid aortic valve. Generally, the ascending aorta is affected in two thirds of the cases, but also the descending aorta can be involved and the root phenotype also exists. The dissections are rare, but they can still occur in the 0.1 percent of patients per year. The characteristic of uh, uh, the, the, the structural the structural characteristic of the patients with uh, bicuspid orthopathy is uh, the deficiency of fibrillin 1, which causes a disrupted architect architecture of the aortic wall. Uh, in general, uh, there have been uh, uh, many papers published in this regard that the patients with uh, bicuspid orthopathy are characterized by a quicker increase of the aortic sizes in comparison to the normal population and actually according to this report the ratio is up to 4.8 times the normal growth in the general population. 
there have been many uh, uh, imaging and experimental studies trying to correlate the type of dilatation with the specific morphology of uh, the aortic valve and the results uh, have not been very consistent in the literature and it's difficult to predict what type of dilatation is going to occur according to the morphology of the aortic uh, valve, the bicuspid aortic valve. However, uh, what has been uh, uh, well demonstrated is that patients with bicuspid, or bicuspid aortic valve have got an abnormal aortic helical flow and according to the shape of the helical flow, if it's right-handed or left-handed, we do uh, um, have two different types of uh, dilatation. Uh, for a right-handed uh, helicoid shape, we have got an eccentric dilatation of the ascending aorta mainly, whereas for the left uh, shape, we have got uh, uh, non-eccentric dilatation and more root morphology. Also, some uh, additional parameters have been uh, identified on the MRI scan to try to predict the type of aortic dilatation and for example the angle between left ventricle and the aorta and the angle jet and the aorta are predictive of mid ascending phenotype. Along with this uh, recently uh, along with these imaging parameters uh, recently uh, his, uh, has increased the attention for the uh, inflammatory markers and the serum markers uh, that might affect uh, aortic dilatation or might be associated with the uh, uh, dilated ascending aorta, particularly some metalloproteinases and also the uh, TGF and uh, his its ratio with uh, the endoglin. So what about the management of these patients? So early imaging is uh, important and uh, um, is also important to maintain on fall, regular follow-up patients with uh, a dilated ascending aorta, although the diameters are below four centimeters. It's important to screen the first degree relatives. There are not clear data about beta blockers and uh, uh, angiotensin to antagonists in terms of slowing down the disease. The important message to keep in mind is that the dilatation of the aorta continues even after uh, an aortic valve replacement. And therefore, it's important to keep this patient. For what is concerning the cutoff uh, for intervention, generally uh, patients with the cuspid aortic valve need intervention if their diameters are uh, equal or higher than uh, 50 millimeters in presence of risk factors. The same consideration do apply to the aortic root uh, and generally aortic root and ascending aorta shouldn't be considered as two different entities. The same uh, um, sites criteria do apply to both of them. For risk factors, we consider family history of the section, rapid expansion, coarctation and hypertension. The other uh, pretty uh, important subgroup of patients is the, the patients affected by Marfan syndrome. So generally, uh, it's uh, two, three patients every thousand people. The disease, as we, we all know, is caused by a mutation of the fibrillin 1, which causes a deregulation of TGF beta factor. There are up to 500 mutations known at present. It's an uh, autosomal dominant inherited disorder for the 75% of the cases, and it's also sporadic in the 25% of the patients. The uh, diagnosis of, uh, of Marfan is based on the revised Ghent nosology. Uh, which compared to the original Ghent criteria put more weight on the cardiovascular manifestations in which the aortic aneurysm and the ectopia lentis are the cardinal clinical uh, features. Uh, for what is concerning the general management of patients with uh, Marfan disease, of course, uh, as mentioned by Christoph uh, with his previous presentation, strict blood pressure control is of paramount importance. 
and beta blockers should be part of the treatment in all patients. Uh, also, the angiotensin 2 antagonists are, in, are uh, advised unless contraindicated, and it's important to monitor them very closely for the first uh, uh, period uh, following the diagnosis with uh, a repeat imaging every six months and then uh, um, every year, unless, of course, the root is growing significantly. After uh, an initial excitement uh, around the angiotensin 2 antagonist in terms of uh, slowing down the growth rate and the Marfan syndrome, uh, actually, um, which has been basically supported only by one trial, the COMPARE trial, actually, the uh, three following trials have failed to show an overall benefit in, uh, in adding angiotensin 2 antagonist uh, in the treatment of these patients in terms of slowing down the growth rate. What is concerning the timing of surgery, which is the key point for these patients, generally he is uh, indicated uh, um, in Marfan patients with the uh, aortic diameter equal or higher than 50 millimeters. In patients with the risk factors, the threshold goes down uh, to 45 millimeters. For risk factors, we, we, we mean rapid expansion of descending aorta or aortic root, uh, family history of uh, dissection, um, progressive aortic regurgitation of mitral regurgitation that are often associated with, this, uh, uh, with the dilatation of the aorta but also female contemplating pregnancy and patients with the Schwenson ratio higher than 10. Uh, although the diagnosis of Marfan is not confirmed, patients with Marfanoid manifestations due to con connective tissue disorders without complete Marfan criteria should anyway be treated as Marfan patients. The, the, the next subgroup of patients is uh, the patients affected by lois diet syndrome. Uh, it was first described in 2005. Uh, this is a primary mutation of the TGF-beta gene. Uh, it's autosomal dominant. Uh, there are uh, various manifestations, but from the cardiovascular point of view, the arterial tortuosity and uh, vascular dilatation and dissections are characteristic features. Also, patients affected by lois diets can dissect at small diameters, and they need to image the entire cardiovascular system. There are different uh, subtypes of Lois Dietz. Uh, um, up to now, it's uh, five subtypes described. Uh, the, the, the type two is generally uh, the more aggressive, and uh, most of these patients uh, undergo uh, an, an operation at a relatively young age. The Lois Dietz type three is generally uh, characterized by associated mitral valve disease, and uh, so as is, is also characterized by a better um, outcome, uh, so as the Lois Diaz 4 and 5 that are uh, somehow less aggressive. Uh, these patients require a strict follow up, generally on a yearly basis, strict blood pressure control, uh, exercise restrictions. Uh, avoid to prescribe medications that might affect the blood pressure or interfere uh, at the cardiovascular system level. And uh, in terms of intervention, we've got uh, two different groups overseeing uh, the uh, surgical management of these patients. One is the John Hopkins group which states that uh, patients with Lois Dietz 1 and 2, uh, which are the most aggressive subtypes, should have surgery at the diameter uh, that is basically less than 4 cm, whereas for the Lois Dietz 3, it's recommended an intervention for diameters between 4 and 
and for the lowest deeds four and five, uh, generally it's advised the intervention for the hammers of 4.5 or bigger. It's a different view, the one supported by the Montalcino Aortic Consortium, where generally intervention is recommended at the threshold of uh, 4.5, with the exceptions of women with uh, type 2 uh, Lois Diaz uh, mutation and severe extraotic features, where uh, surgery is recommended at the cutoff of 4 uh, centimeter. Another uh, subgroup of, uh, of um, inherited autopathies is represented by patients affected by Enler Danlos syndrome, which is a very heterogeneous group of genetic connective disorders. The overall frequency is one in 5,000. Uh, it's characteristic of this subgroup of patients, hypermobility of the, of the joints with skin hyperextensibility. But what we we have uh, identified up to now 13 subtypes. But well, what is important for a cardiovascular point of view is uh, is uh, the vascular and the down loss, which uh, was classified uh, as type four previously. Fortunately, is relatively rare. It's one uh, in uh, 100,000, and it's uh, due to a mutation of the gene coding for the collagenasis 3A1. It's an autosomal dominant disease, and up to 80% of these patients generally uh, have a major cardiovascular acute event by 40 years old. Guidelines recommend surgical intervention in the vascular and learn loss only in the setting of life threatening complications due to the increased surgical risk. However, the mortality uh, it's it's very high in this subgroup of patients, uh, particularly when you do intervene in emergency fashion. Also, because uh, uh, the presence of collagenases in uh, in the blood circulation uh, causes uh, the arrangement of the coagulation, which uh, might lead to uh, even uh, more important bleeding. I must say that with the uh, endovascular treatment, although not ideal, uh, the mortality has gone down a little bit, uh, up to uh, 30, 40 percent, but still remains very high. Uh, patients affected by uh, Turner syndrome can develop uh, cardiovascular issues and um, generally are characterized by diffuse vasculopathy with arterial stiffness and hypertension. For these uh, patients, uh, the, the normal cutoff uh, uh, cannot be applied because they, they are generally uh, characterized by a low BSA. Therefore, we need uh, a, a, parameter, a parameter to guide intervention that is indexed to their BSA, and it's particularly useful the Yale aortic index, and uh, uh, intervention is advised in case of the Yale aortic index equal of higher than 2.5 centimeter uh, over uh, meter square. The, the, the final subgroup of patients is the one characterized by familial thoracic aortic aneurysm. Generally, these patients uh, are, uh, are characterized by arterial dilatation and risk of dissection. There are generally not systemic features. Uh, the, the disease is autosomal dominant, although the penetrance is variable and might be associated to multiple uh, mutations. Uh, generally, there are not clear data in terms of timing of surgery and uh, benefits of medical management. We do apply for these patients more, more or less the same general uh, medical management that we, we do apply for most of the patients with the uh, optom. And this is a summary of the different cutoff for, for intervention. However, uh, I want to uh, summarize briefly what uh, are the strategies currently available for patients with autopathy. Basically, uh, 
what has been studied and investigated over the years is the result of replacing the dilated segment of the aorta with or without a prosthetic aortic valve with or without preserving the, the native aortic valve in the context of root replacement. And this uh, uh, applies to dilatation affecting the ascending aorta, the aortic root and the, the proximal portion of the aortic arch. There are more complex procedures for replacing the aortic arch and uh, Christophe has mentioned the frozen elephant trunk, which uh, might contribute to stabilize the aortic arch further and also uh, needs uh, mention the, the PERS procedure that is very useful in terms of uh, slowing down the dilatation of the aorta, but we don't really have uh, clear data on this procedure in terms of preventing uh, uh, acute aortic syndromes. What we can say is that might stabilize the aortic diameters uh, uh, even in the context of specific aortopathies such as uh, the Marfan syndrome, but we don't have data in terms of preventing aortic, acute aortic syndrome or applying uh, this technique in uh, broader subgroups of patients affected by autopathies. Uh, finally, I want to stress uh, the importance of the autopathy and the end because, uh, uh, yes, it's true that we've got a general guidance uh, from the, the, the guidelines, but each patient is different and also uh, the uh, different considerations have to be made according to the specific patient's situation. Therefore, having forums where uh, different professionals with different background and expertise can provide their inputs, particularly in the context of patients affected, with, uh, affected by aortic uh, disease, it's, it's, very, it's very important. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Gianluca, for uh, a really nice talk, just summarising um, the different surgical approaches and the thresholds and the challenges. Um, in the interests of time, let's say we're running over a little bit. So um, what we'll do is we'll go to the MDT section um, and discuss a case, and then we've got, uh, we'll have got we go to the questions, because I know there's a few questions that have come up in the chat um, in the panel section, um, and then we'll try and uh, get back on track with regards to timing. So um, the speakers will all be um, uh, available, so um, we can include that in the discussion discussion section. Um, so thank you for the for the for the great talks with lots of information. Um, we've got two cases that we had um, prepared for the MDT section and uh, Lima, I know um, that you and um, a colleague Rhoda had prepared a case, um, but I wonder if we could do the case that I've got um, first of all, um, because uh, we've got a, a case that came up over the uh, just very recently that imputably encapsulates some of the challenges um, in terms of the genetic diagnosis, interpreting the genetic results, family screening, surgical thresholds, what kind of intervention. Um, uh, so it raises lots of questions and demonstrates some of the challenges that we have in terms of um, managing the family um, and uh, patients with aortopathies and when we need to think about surgical threshold. So I'll go to um, start our case presentation and then we'll take questions and have some discussion at the end. Um, so let me just check whether this is now sharing. Uh, now, are you able to see that screen? Yep. Yes. Yes. So um, this is a case that's uh, very much ongoing, so we still have more questions than answers, but let's say it illustrates some of the difficulties. So the patient I've got is a 31 year old male who was initially seen back in 2016, referred initially with chest pain and palpitations, but the refer referrer also noted that there was a family history of his father having had an aortic aneurysm. And when he was seen in 2016, shortly afterwards, he also had a left frontal cerebrovascular accident, and this had been seen and investigated at King's College Hospital. Um, and he'd been started on a pixaban um, following the, the stroke. There'd not been any arrhythmia that had been identified. Um, so let's say he was otherwise completely fit and well, um, and he had a family history of his father having suffered an aortic dissection um, at a young age. I think he was in his late 40s or early 50s when he had his dissection. And there was an, a history of his, fam uh, his paternal grandfather also having died young of 
what we didn't know, we didn't know the details, but it was presumed to have possibly been some sort of aortic cause. So um, it was initially seen for some reason in an ICC clinic, and I think that may actually turn out to be more relevant than we thought. Um, so it was seen in an ICC clinic um, and had initial investigations with a transthoracic echocardiogram and an MRI scan. And both of these identified borderline aortic root dilatation at about 3.9 centimetres. This is an absolute diameter, not an indexed one, but it's a borderline dilatation, so just really above the upper, just above the upper limit of normal. Um, and there was some noted to be some trabeculation of the apex of the left ventricle and borderline ejection fraction of 53% on MRI with no regional wall motion abnormalities and no particular scarring nor any other abnormalities on tissue characterization. So a couple of borderline features, but nothing much else to hang your hat on apart from a family history. His ECG was normal with no particular conduction abnormalities at all. And because of the family history and these subtle abnormalities, he was referred to um, Lima for genetic assessment. And Lima felt that on phenotyping, there weren't enough diagnostic features of a formal syndromal type of aortopathy, but it was very slightly hypermobile. And so we felt that in because we hadn't identified a real concrete abnormality or confirmed sort of syndromal appearance, that in view of the family history of his father having had an aortic dissection at a youngish age, um, that genetic testing in the father was appropriate. Unfortunately, he was still alive, so that was possible. And so that's what we discussed in the family in terms of that being the first step in the diagnosis. And so we, we saw his father in our genetic service and his father lives uh, elsewhere in the UK, but he did come to see us and we did the genetic testing panel and identified um, a mutation in the ACTA2 gene, um, which is one that is recognised as being associated with um, familial thoracic aortic aneurysms. We then uh, dis, uh, carried out family cascade screening and then the patient that we have, the, um, we identified the same gene uh, mutation in him. And so we entered our screening programme. We also advised that there was family screening um, for genetic mutation in other family members. And he discussed this with his brother, but his brother had been slightly reluctant because um, he was completely fit and well to consider this. But it's something that had been discussed with him. So the patient that we have on identification of these borderline abnormalities and uh, genetic mutation was entered into screening. Because of the identification of the ACTA2 gene, um, as part of the syndrome that we see sometimes associated with this gene, they can have small uh, small vessel um, cerebral abnormalities. So because he presented with a stroke um, at, as part of the early presentation, we reviewed his cerebrovascular imaging and um, didn't feel that despite him having this ACTA2 gene mutation, that the, uh, genet that the vascular abnormalities uh, were such of uh, was suggestive of this kind of syndromal abnormality, and it was felt to be that this stroke was much more just like a straightforward cryptogenic stroke. Um, and so the one thing that hadn't been investigated um, as part of his initial workup was a PFO. Or it was um, exclusion of a PFO. So we completed that set of investigations, and in fact, he did have a positive bubble study and confirmed a, um, confirmed a PFO. So we went on to perform PFO closure in January of 2020 and um, he, the patient remained under follow up with us. His father is under follow up, was under follow up elsewhere. I think he was in the West Midlands. Um, so he was under follow up with their clinical team um, and he suffered a further extension of type B dissection and sadly required further surgery, um, but unfortunately developed several problems with infection after his uh, subsequent surgery um, and was managed palliatively and he passed away last year, essentially from post-surgical complications from his his um, uh, management uh, from his uh, type B dissection. And I spoke with a patient um, after this and had a long chat with him. And he was the patient himself was entirely well. His blood pressure was slightly borderline and he'd been started on Ramipril. Now we know that um, there's been some data suggesting that angiotensin receptor blockers perhaps may be preferable or beta blockers. But this is a patient who had an ACTA2 mutation rather than a fibrillin or TGF beta um, mutation. We're not quite sure whether there's any particular uh, difference in this group. But but he'd been started on um, Ramipril and his blood pressure was better, so we continued it. Um, and he, let's say, continued to remain very well. Um, 
And on the surveillance imaging that we had, his aortic diameters had not changed at all really between 2016 and the most recent imaging that we had in late 2021. So in late 2021, his uh, imaging still showed signs of Valsalva measurement of around 3.9 centimetres. The sinotubular junction was preserved. The ascending aorta was 3.6 centimetres. The aortic valve was trileaflet with normal function. And there hadn't really been any change in his LV function. So this is uh, his echocardiogram that we did on the 30th November, and this was a focus study just really for uh, post device closure of the PFO just to check there was no residual leak. There was no residual shunt. And as you can see there, the ventricular function is just about borderline, but not really anything there on the uh, on the echo imaging that would raise any alarm bells. And he certainly hadn't had any symptoms of palpitations and the aortic route. Sorry, the last picture there um, hasn't really come across very well in, on expansion, but um, his aortic route certainly doesn't look dilated um, beyond it. that measurement is there 3.9 centimetres and there's nothing uh, concerning on the appearance of that. And this is an MRI, uh, this is stills from the MRI scan that he had as part of surveillance um, and this was done in September. 2021 and shows that you know there's maybe borderline effacement in sun tubular junction but the absolute diameters are certainly not dilated the way that we do the protocols because he's a young patient for serial imaging we don't really want to do gated cts as part of our long-term surveillance so we use mri scans and um, when we do mri scans looking at the whole aorta um, because of the protocol we don't get such gated measurements down at the aortic roots a little bit of motion artifact so um, depending on the motion artifact slightly increases the, the measured diameter 42, but if you were to do a proper gated study um, to get a nice crisp measurement, it's actually about 3.9 centimetres. So there's nothing there that shows that there's been any rapid expansion in terms of the aortic root diameter. So we thought all was entirely well. And so, and this is um, just um, some images from his um, MRA scan in September 2021, which shows essentially no really concerning features despite the family history. Um, there's a little bit of motion artifact, as you can see down here at the aortic root, but there's no evidence of any abnormality anywhere else. So we thought all was well. And then in February 2022, um, I was very surprised to hear that the patient had been uh, had suffered an out of hospital cardiac arrest and um, had not survived. Um, the information that I got, the, re the way I came to find out about this was when I got an email from uh, the medical examiner at, uh, in our hospital asking, saying that the patient had suffered an out of hospital cardiac arrest and there was an initial coroner's post-mortem that had not identified any cause of death and the heart was to be sent to Mary, uh, Professor Mary Shepherd for further evaluation. Um, and I specifically asked whether there was a dissection given the family history and and the gene mutation and I was told that there was no dissection on that initial. Now I haven't seen the post-mortem report, it was just the, what was relayed to me verbally from our medical examiner, um, but that was the information that we had. So of course, we um, and, the, and so we were waiting to hear back with regard to what uh, what Mary Shepherd's um, PM has found and I hadn't heard anything until last week when the patient's mother contacted us to say that they had been given some information from um, the post-mortem that Professor Shepherd had done um, and the information that had been passed back to the family was that there was an acute and healing dissection and family screening was advised. Now that's all the information that I have at the moment and we've contacted Professor Shepherd to try and get a bit more information. Um, but um, so I don't know exactly what the full post-mortem has shown. So when I had a long chat with the, um, the patient's mother on Friday when, um, when she contacted us with this information, um, and I was then looking for a bit more information and I understand that the patient had actually had a collapse whilst he was on a train, so not on exertion, but he was just while, uh, on train and then had some bystander CPR and was taken to King's Hospital um, for resuscitation, but unfortunately they were unable to resuscitate him. And looking at the information that was documented in King's from their A&E resuscitation, they noted a pericardial effusion around the RV, but there's no more information. I don't know exactly what was put on the death certificate. And so the questions that I have at this stage really are, was there a dissection? And if so, where was the dissection? Was it um, in the root? Was it in the ascending aorta? Where exactly was, dis uh, was the dissection? And the second question is, even if there is a dissection, would this explain the death? Because 
usually for an aortic dissection to cause a collapse and a sudden death in a young patient, we would expect that to be an aortic rupture and massive hemopericardium. And when we see fam patients who are referred for family screening and they arrive having been given a death certificate and a postmortem uh, findings from a relative who's passed away, the diagnosis of an aortic rupture and hemopericardium is not something that I would have expected the post the coroner's postmortem to miss. Um, the question, uh, you know, the comments from the King's A and E notes does raise the question, but I think we do need to find out the details of whether there was what Mary Shepherd saw was a massive hemopericardium from an aortic rupture, which could have explained the death, or was it just that there was a small ulcer and a small dissection that was healing? In which case, whilst that's a concern, it perhaps wouldn't explain a sudden death in a 31 year old patient. So it's really important that we find out what the actual mechanism of the death was. Was it a focal dissection at the ostium of the coronary artery, which may not have been enough to cause a hemopericardium and uh, aortic rupture, but a focal, uh, focal dissection causing a ventricular arrhythmia? Um, that's one of the questions that's still outstanding. And another question is, if it is an aortic dissection, ultimately, that seems to have been the cause of death, is the ACTA2 mutation that we have identified in the family pathogenic enough to account for this? And therefore, is that the sole culprit genetic lesion? Or is it a variant of not entirely pathogenic significance, in which case that affects how we then counsel the family? So the question that the family are now asking is, how do we risk stratify other members of the family, in particular the brother? If we do think that this patient has died from an aortic dissection and the ACT2 gene mutation is the culprit lesion, we then can do predictive screening in the brother. If we do identify him to have the same ACT2 mutation, given that we given that we might then say that his brother has had an aortic dissection at essentially a diameter of well below what we would consider the current surgical thresholds. What surgical threshold would we consider for his brother, who essentially would be somebody who's completely asymptomatic? And if you were to image him, if he were to have a normal aorta or a borderline aorta at 3.94 centimetres, what would we consider as the surgical threshold for that patient? Bearing in mind you're talking about major surgery on a completely asymptomatic patient purely for prognostic benefit. And if we were to consider surgery, what surgical approach would we advise? Would we say that, or should we say that he has um, a bental approach with a mechanical valve, which would commit a young patient to anticoagulation from uh, for a valve replacement with a normal functioning valve. If we put a tissue valve in to avoid the anticoagulation, uh, doing a bental approach with a mechanical valve, if we do a tissue valve, the concern in a young patient would be that that tissue valve would degenerate quite quickly and he would be looking at redo surgery. So neither of those um, bental approaches are ideal in a young person with a normal functioning valve, assuming that his brother's valve is a trileaflet valve and normally functioning like this patient's valve. The valve sparing root replacement would be a more attractive approach in terms of preserving the valve and avoiding the need for anticoag anticoagulation nor a tissue prosthesis that would degenerate early. Um, and that's certainly a very valid approach. Now, given that the aortic diameter may not be particularly enlarged, um, one of the questions that would be proposed is whether or not just putting an external wrap on the um, aorta to prevent further dilatation would be a, a suitable alternative. The concern I would have with that approach would be that we've got patients to the index case in terms of um, dissection is a patient who had a dissection without much in the way of dilatation and therefore there isn't that radial strain. There's some inherent abnormality and just putting a wrap on the outside where you're not changing the geometry or the tension um, inside means you're still leaving the substrate there for potentially the same thing. So I would be concerned that the external wrap would not provide protection against dissection and therefore I'm not sure that would be the surgical approach but this is something that we would um, we would need to discuss um, in a multidisciplinary setting. So it's a challenge this case and um, we're still waiting for further information but it throws up lots of questions. So I think uh, perhaps in the first instance, uh, Lima, I don't know if you're still online, I don't know if you've had a chance to, because I know I've emailed you about some of this, I don't know if you had a chance if you would be able to comment on the genetic side of things, and then I'll come to maybe Christoph and Gianluca to see what they would say. Of course, from a, a surgical of course. Point of um, intervention. Can you hear me, Aso? Yes, I can. Um, so he has an intronic splice size mut variant that was identified. Um, so it's not a variant that has been described um, in the literature or in the normal population. Um, uh, the um, 
the uh, predictions um, studies for this variant actually predict that it will cause a decrease in the function of the gene, um, specifically exon 5, so that it, it might cause um, a skipping of that um, exon. So it, it is thought to be um, likely uh, to be pathogenic. However, because there was not enough information, it was called a variant of unknown clinical significance when it was reported. Um, and we had been recommended that screening um, or segregation studies in the family members um, would be appropriate. So when we tested, we tested the father first because he had a much more clean phenotype. Um, and then we tested uh, the same misprint in um, in the in, in the proband of the patient that you're talking about um, who passed away. Um, and he also had the same misprint. Um, so currently we are in the process of um, seeing his brother to see whether we will consider testing in him. Um, so uh, it is still a variant of unknown clinical significance, but most likely the cause for um, the iotopathy in this family. So in terms of um, predictive testing, if we found that, I mean, suppose if we find the same mutation, in some ways, then it makes it slightly easier and that we would have to assume for management purposes that it is predictive uh, or it is pathogenic. But if we find that he doesn't carry the same mutation, would we then be reassured about discharging him from an aortic dissection perspective? And I suppose um, the other question would be, well, we need to get some more information from the postmortem post and confirm whether we think dissection was a cause of death. Because if we don't think the dissection explains the death, then we would have to go down the whole cat uh, route of considering other investigations for an arrhythmic cause arrhythmic of death. Phenotype, yeah. yeah. So with him, I think it would be with the brother, it would be difficult for us to counsel saying that we don't need to see him if he doesn't have the misprint because we're still not sure about this misprint um, or the or the variant that we're talking about. So um, I think that we have to be careful, um, especially after this family have gone through so much uh, or, um, in terms of having a young death in the family as well. It'll be very difficult for us to make those kind of conclusions, but that is part of the counselling that we will um, take into account. I agree. I think that's one of the things that what it demonstrates is really the challenges in, and the importance of identifying not just a genetic change, but the significance and how that influences the way you counsel the patients and the family screening and, and the discussions. It's, it's, it's a real minefield and I think this case nicely demonstrates some of the challenges. Yeah, I fully agree with that. Yes. Thank you, Yasa, for highlighting this. <laughs> yeah, so it's a real challenge. Um, Christoph, in terms of um, thresholds or what you would think, and um, if, if you get any other thoughts or comments about this case. Oh, well, I'm, just, uh, I'm not sure if Christoph's still able to hear us. Gianluca, I don't know if you've been, if you would have any other thoughts or yeah. comments about surgical thresholds. Very difficult, very, very difficult because it's a very exceptional case. And of course, mm -hmm. the family is stressed by the recent situation with, uh, with the younger kid that passed away. I mean, probably I would be a bit more aggressive, although it's only for prognostic reasons uh, and we don't have real evidence uh, uh, that the, his mutation is associated with uh, and you know, property, probably I would be a bit more aggressive, uh, close follow up and uh, threshold for intervention at four centimeter of ascending aorta or aortic root. And definitely I would go for uh, valve sparing root replacement procedure because uh, this is what we have been doing for many years with um, reproducible and very good results. Uh, slowing down the disease of dilatation, the rate of dilatation, I don't think is the response in this, in this case. Therefore, a PERS procedure would not really add any benefit because we, we don't really know if uh, uh, this extra support uh, somehow would reduce uh, the rate of possible uh, dissection long term. So I, I would go in this uh, specific case, uh, very exceptional also in terms of uh, the family history and, and mutation. I would go with, with, with a safe procedure with a very good long term result, which might be root replacement valve sparing procedure at a threshold of around four centimeters. 
I agree. I think uh, I think the pairs has many attractions in terms of it being a sort of procedure that avoids bypass. But I think you have to think really carefully about what it offers in terms of removing the source of or the substrate for complications and dissection. And when we know that aortic root diameter is really the main driver, then containing the aorta at a threshold or at a size below that is a reasonable approach. But for some of these other situations, I think it's really important as part of the assessment is to find out as much as you can about the anatomical information of the person in the family who's had a dissection to know. Um, because if like you, in this case, we have cases where aortic dilatation is not the primary driver, there's some other intrinsic factor. It has a big influence on the surgical approach that we would consider um, in terms of what it offers the patient. Um, and the the other thing that we just need to clarify with this case and um, questions that we need to um, answer are still, what is the mechanism of death? Um, we're not entirely certain yet that the aortic dissection is the prime cause of death, but that's something that we need to clarify but we have to keep an open mind as to where, what it is. Um, so that, that might explain the coronary ischemia and the pericardial. Exactly, exactly. Death, death, exactly. Though, uh, no, it's, it's a very unfortunate case once again, because of, you know, most of the patients uh, end up on the table for, for a cardiac operation. But uh, again, it was very unfortunate because even though it triggered an arrhythmic uh, event uh, along with the dissection of the pericardial effusion was basically unrecoverable. So yeah, what we don't know is, let's say, I mean, it's very unusual. And the thing that still, I'm still questioning is it's very unusual for a patient to, I mean, the pericardial effusion was just a comment that was made in the recess notes, but that wasn't information that was conveyed to me from the initial post-mortem, the coroner's post-mortem. And that's not something I would have expected them to miss as a significant pericardial effusion. So I need to, so I'm trying to find out, and, and, and this is again, highlights some of the importance of digging around and getting the right details. We need to find out in detail what the findings were at post-mortem to see whether it was a focal dissection that just caused <laughs> arrhythmia or whether there's you know the dissection is a small bystander thing and actually it was a primary arrhythmia from some sort of cardiomyopathy in which case actually we would need to consider whether or not we need to consider a device um, for his brother as uh, you know his prophylactic approach so there's still lots of questions but I thought this was an interesting case to illustrate the importance of the phenotyping and getting the family history information in detail to know how you counsel your patients and how we manage them longer term. Uh, and yeah, so this prob case probably also highlights the overlap um, of yeah. what, you know between arrhythmic and aortopathies as well, because that's been noted yeah. in quite a few um, cases of genetic um, or rather syndromic um, aortopathy as well. It is, and it's something that we haven't had a chance to really um, uh, elaborate on in this morning session, oh, sorry, in this afternoon session, but I think it's something that we're, we're definitely seeing, um, and maybe we'll come back to it in future sessions in a year or two when we have a bit more information. Um, but yes, that's something that we're definitely noticing. Um, in the interest of time, I think, um, Lima, I know that the case that you and Rhoda had prepared, maybe if we have time at the end of the pregnancy session, because it kind of spans both, so we could do it then if we've got time. Um, but in the interest of time, because I know we're, we're coming up to the break, but we've got some questions from the chat, which I'd just briefly like to um, uh, to, to, get to address. Um, and the first question was uh, whether I, or not we were advocating. Sorry, Lima, were you going to say? Um, I, sorry, yeah, so I, I have replied to most of the questions except oh, for okay. one, yeah, so, um, which is directed to um, uh, Christoph Ninabar, um, and, and the question is, do you recommend any particular antihypertensives to reduce the risk of dissection in patients with TAA, Losartan versus beat blocker. OK, thanks, Christopher, you. Yeah, uh, thank you for the question. <clears throat> there is no recommendation. Uh, as, uh, if, you, if you look at the guidelines in Japan, in the US and Europe, uh, they talk about these ominous 120 or 130 millimeter systolic. What we recommend is a combination of a beta blocker and a sartan uh, as tolerated. I hate to add uh, diuretics, sometimes I have to, but those are my main components that I recommend in combination. Thank you. Uh, the rest I have answered, Yasu. Um, oh, right, okay, thank you. 
Um, the only have... thing I wanted to highlight was Dirk Wilson. Um, were you asking about BAV? If so, I have replied. If not, um, I, please clarify and I'll help again. So I, I saw that question and I think one of the things I just want to, or one of the points I wanted to make was, yes, I think I, I certainly would recommend uh, clinical screening um, for first degree relatives. And we've got a standard template letter for patients with bicuspidiotic valves saying that we would recommend first degree relatives have screening with an echocardiogram. They just need referral for an echo. They don't necessarily need to be seen clinically unless there's some other feature. Um, and one case that, bring, that comes to mind that um, highlights this was we had a patient who, with my ACHD hat on, was handed over to me for as part of transition, a young patient with a bicuspid valve that had intervention at a young age and then was handed over to me as a teenager for ongoing follow up and he was completely well. Um, and we asked about family screening and whether this had been done. And the mother who came with him to his transition appointment said um, that her father had a bicuspid valve. She didn't have one, um, so she thought the screening had been done. I asked if his the patient's father had had an echo. They said he's completely well, but um, no. But they went away and got screening. And lo and behold, they'd, they'd assumed that because the mother, his mother's father had a bicuspid valve, that if there was anything familial, it was down that line. But the patient's father, who was completely unrelated to the mother's side, um, went along for a routine screening echo completely asymptomatic and was found to have a big rock of calcium in his bicuspid aortic valve um, at the age of 49 and it had a velocity of about 3.8. So he came to see me for surveillance and uh, he had fairly rapidly progressing aortic stenosis and we ended up having to operate on him about 18 months <coughs> later. So um, so I would recommend uh, family screening with an echocardiogram for just for the first degree relatives, but just an echocardiogram in the first instance. They don't necessarily need a clinic referral unless the echocardiogram is abnormal. Uh, as abnormal or there's some other um, risk factor or, or red flag or question. Um, in the, in, so just, we're almost caught up on time. Uh, so Christoph, I don't, um, in terms of the case, I, I, I don't think I've managed to, uh, we managed to hear whether you had any other, anything else you wanted to add on the case that we presented just now. Well, uh, it, it's a very interesting case and, and you did what we probably would have done as well. It's an interesting case and it needs to be kept in mind. Yeah. I think it's a learning lesson. Yeah, I think uh, a lot more questions search yeah. and I think um, and I think one of the other things is we can't assume anything. Um, one of the things that you learn increasingly as you go is never make any assumptions. We can't assume the aortic dissection is a cause of death. We need to clarify and confirm because um, we are seeing that there is an overlap with yeah. um, cardiomyopathies and arrhythmias and we are seeing sudden deaths in some of these patients, perhaps not of an aortic cause. So it's an area that we're we're looking at. Can I can I make a little comment to yeah. to one detail that uh, Lima mentioned in her talk? Lima, you, you mentioned John Ritter, uh, this TV personality who, who dropped dead uh, and, and was found to suffer from aortic dissection. He actually had a ACTA2 a mutation, as I found out later, and, and he didn't drop dead. He was actually the victim of a cardiologist mm -hmm. because he was admitted from the set to Thousand Oaks St. Joseph's Hospital uh, with a suspicion of an MI because of his chest pain. And they went in and cast him from from the groin and obviously accelerated the dissection and it couldn't reach the coronaries. Eventually, he propelled the person propelled the dissection into the root, and the end. That was the end of it. Almost the end of it. And they I, had they had actually an echo done before the ca the cardiologist went in with the help of a radiologist, and the echo for some mysterious reason got lost. And nobody could find the echo anymore, and the echo would have probably seen a, a lamella or something, and the whole thing would have been turned around. So a tragic event. Yeah. So, Christoph, I am aware of that story. I was trying to be polite um, and not actually <laughs> <laughs> ditch the cardiologist there, but thank you for the story. No, I think the cardiologists need to broaden their mind and think aorta much more. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Um, well, so thank you. Uh, thank you, everybody. Just uh, so much looking at the interest of time. So I think we're almost back on track now. So I think we're scheduled to go for a 15 minute break.